सर या बोल आई थिंक सो नाउ चैट ऑप्शन इज देयर सर फॉर एवरीवन यस ग्रेट नाउ वी कैन वेट फॉर 5 मिनट्स डॉक्टर मनोज जी इज नॉट लॉग्ड इन इज येट आई जस्ट सर्च हिम सर नाइस काम Now there are already forty-two participants. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I need to search Dr. Manoj. Yeah, I think so. Dr. Manoj is also there. Yeah, yeah great. Okay, now I think we are on time. Exactly. Yeah, time is good. Hello, are we on? Yeah, we are on. So should we start? I yeah, mean, you can put in the first slide. By the time I introduce you, Shishir, should we start? Yeah, sir. It's already five thirty, sir. Great. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> friends, I, I I welcome you to this first session of uh, the E-tuned Meet. Uh, in collaboration with Zydus and uh, IOW, and we plan to have a series of meetings here over the period of uh, the next few months till the time the crisis and the situation improves. And we thought it's a good idea to utilize all our time during the lockdown. Uh, we have a very esteemed uh, speaker here today. You all know him, is Dr. Manoj Manekar. Uh, he is a consultant ENT surgeon and the head of the. Uh, cochlear implant uh, unit at Manoj Super Speciality and Research Center in Calicut. Uh, he has a fantastic setup and uh, he has a lot of cars. Uh, though he hasn't invited me personally, but uh, I take this opportunity to request him to invite us also. And uh, today he's speaking on a very interesting part of uh, decision making in a early squamous disease because on a, a lot of us. We have cholestatomas which are early, uh, or we are suspecting cholestatomas. We are not so sure if uh, they are the right patients to really operate or not, and what should be an ideal protocol to uh, treat this kind of patients. So I wait for Dr. Manoj here, and uh, I request Dr. Manoj Manikot. He's live from Calicut here to kindly begin his talk. And foremost, I would like to thank Zaidis Shishir. Uh, Subhash team uh, for being here, and of course Dr. Manoj for being a very very uh, cooperative uh, and a very helpful speaker in trying to get things right for you. Thank you, Dr. Manoj, for uh, the invite here, and uh, we request you to start your talk. Hi, Manish, and thank you so much. And um, mm -hmm. uh, thanks once again, Zaidus, for doing this. I've been also thinking of doing something like this. I'm glad that Zaidus came in and uh, decided to do this. Now today's topic, before we um, you know go into it, is about uh, decision making in early squamous disease. And for those people who don't know me, I am from uh, Calicut. My place was called Nizia KNT Hospital. It's a um, almost exclusively otology center. We do a little bit of neck and some skull. Uh, base, Manoj, but... can you be a little louder, please? A little louder. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, this is better. And just uh, one small clarification for everyone in the audience: you have a chat option on your screen. So, in case you have any doubts, uh, which uh, or questions in between, also you can keep on posting those questions. And as in, uh, when we get a gap, we will be asking the uh, Dr. Manoj the questions. Yes, Dr. Manoj, please go on. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, I think uh, I am kind of visible now, right? Yeah, you are. Okay. Now, um, I am from Calicut, and um, this is a place which in Central Kerala. We are actually in the storm of the COVID thing. Uh, next to Maharashtra, I think we got maximum number of cases here. So, all of us are here at home, safe, and I. I hope you are safe too. Uh, stay at home, be safe. Uh, there are people of a forefront, our own brethren, who are right there in the front and dealing with this virus. So let's start off by uh, giving a small prayer to them. Uh, I think we should salute those uh, medical doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers who are right in the forefront and fighting this pandemic. 
uh, all we have to do now is to stay home and stay safe. Um, now we shall go to the topic itself. Uh, one second. Okay. Now, cholesteatoma has been defined as uh, a destructive formation of the layers of keratinizing stem epithelium accumulating in the mid layer and mastoid. Now, um, there was, when we were studying, there was a very big uh, description of uh, just a um, uh, sack of epithelium with this canvas matrix and which sent to a very complex definition. But in fact, nowadays, the most simplest definition that we get is that we say that when there is epithelium in the middle layer, we call it cholesteatoma. This is also called active squamous chronic auditus media, and the term unsafe ear disease and anticoandral has now been given away. Uh, it also could be a retraction pocket that accumulates keratin debris. Now, uh, we should understand that, um, you know, um, uh, you have this thing called um, uh, keratin uh, in the retraction pocket, and there is a stage of retraction pocket without invisible depth with or without with or with or without bony erosion with early loss of cell cleansing ability so you have at one extreme you have a you know, uh, there is a disease that is really um, progressing where you see that there is a lot of uh, discussion happening the past the discharge on the other end there is a early loss of cell cleansing ability and our topic is basically on the second thing that we see here now, there was a lot of classification for cholesteatoma in the past. It was originally divided into congenital and acquired and acquired into primary acquired and secondary acquired. And those people were persuaded at all. And um, uh, there is also a, um, a pathophysiology of defect complication by Mayerhoff. Um, uh, it was divided into congenital acquired and primary, secondary, and tertiary. There was also the famous TMC staging. They staged according to what we thought of um, uh, malignancy. Site ossicle complication classification, uh, which was done by Bella, Saleh, and Mills, and Kemsalani. We also had uh, the TOS classification of attic cholesteatoma, past tense are one and past tense are two, past tense are one being marginal disease and past tense are two being central disease. There was also the law and talk classification, attic, past tense are Mills classification, so and so, so and so. And there was also a classification based on where it is involved and whether there is uh, inflammation with infection, without infection. Essentially, all these classifications, look at them, each of them are good in certain aspects. But in other things, they are um, very error prone, you know, for identification. For example, you and I could see the same patient and would classify them differentially. Now, a slight change happened by the COS system in 1984, where they said that, it is C would be one, two, three, depending on the, the middle ear cleft, two areas, so three areas. Do you, you have an atlactic drum? Is it grade one, or grade two, grade three, or grade four? You know, grade three and grade four, again, there was a confusion. Now, then you had to signalize them, see if they are moving or not. And whether you have destruction of one ossicle, two ossicle, and three ossicle. I mean, these were slightly better than the earlier classification, but then um, there was this big uh, meeting that happened in 2017 where the Japanese Autological Society, uh, they did this big classification called acquired cholesteatoma where they called it a traction pocket, pass flaxida, uh, uh, you know, sorry. Uh, and then the pass tensa cholesteatoma here, and then the combination of pass tensa and pass flaxida, uh, so you can see this here, past tense are past flaxida and the non-retraction pocket cholesterol are congenital and unclassifiable cholesterol. See, they actually had these kind of things. You know, if you look at them, I will um, call them. See, this is stage one. Cholesterol are localized primary site. Stage two, cholesterol involving two or three sites. And stage three, cholesterol with external complications and or intratemporal pathology classification, <laughs> which could be facial palsy, Adhesive otitis, canal wall destruction, labyrinthine disturbance, labyrinthine fistula, then um, petrous bone destruction, neck abscess, and stage four with intracranial complications. So this divided essentially one into stage one, primary site, two or more sites, stage three with complications, and stage four with intracranial complications. Here again, there was an issue. You know, there were some cases where you could have a labyrinthine disturbance with without any other problem with, with normal hearing okay so now these kind of things they were actually some little bit of issues with this now but our topic what we are going to do today would be basically on the stage one and stage two or the jaws classification 
Now, here again, there was uh, a little bit of uh, this. When I described to you, I'll be talking to you about these things. So you have something where mastered cells, MC0 is where the mastered cell, there is no mastered cell. You can see here in the mastered bone, you see no cellular architecture. Now here in MC1, there was some cells around the mastered androm. You can see that that is a cholestatum, a few air cells here. Now stage MC2 would be a well-developed cellular architecture. You see black here, black is air. And MC3, where the cells go on to the perilabyrinthine area, you can see that behind the labyrinth. Now A is added to each one of them. So you could have MC1A, MC2, A, MC2, 3, where there is aeration, the mastoid or not. Now, you also have a classification for the stapes involvement. So there could be S0, where there is no stapes involvement. S1, with the superstructure surrounded by cholestatoma and granulation. You can see the black is the cholestatoma. And stage 2 is S2. S2, where the stapes foot plate is present. And S3, where the stapes foot plate is not seen during surgery. It may or may not be present, but because extensive granulation, you don't mess with that area. So that is what is S3. Now, after this, you know, because even this classification system did not exactly tell you, it was a very complex system to divide into stage three, would you call it stage three LD with labyrinth and stage three with facial palsy. Now, in the 2016, in the Cholestatoma Congress at Edinburgh, there was this classification system, which is reported in autology and neurotology. You can see that um, in 2017, the Cowley classification. But Cowley is an acronym for CH for the extension, O for the status of muscular chain, L for complications, and E for degree of pneumatization and ventilation. They can only tackle it. Can we mute the people, please? Is it possible? Okay. Now, now wait. Now we will. How is C mentioned? So this Cowley classification is essentially a scoring system. If you have score one to four, it is something. Four to eight is something, and four eight and above is something. So score one is where it involves the Prusak space. And A is no involvement by sinus tympani and B with involvement of sinus tympani. Stage two, where it is the middlier attic and antrum to the level of lateral canal and involvement of the sinus tympani and pro tympanum and three with extensive destruction. So in short, if you have a very early cholestatoma uh, in the middlier space without any involvement of sinus tympani or with just involvement of sinus tympani to stage one, if it involves the antrum and the attic, it is the stage two and there's a lot of destruction which is stage three. Now we will be dealing with uh, the score one. Now you also have the O part here. Now O is where the ossicular chain is intact. You can see through the picture there ossicular chain intact. One way malleus and stapes are present, incurs is eroded. And this is the most common thing that we see here. Malleus and foot plate only. And that is also asked in Cartouche stage B. And three with stapes only, mobile foot plate and fixed stapes and fixed foot plate. Now, this actually eliminates one of the classification errors of the JAWS system. See, so JAWS, they said, stapes foot plate not seen during that. And as uh, autologic surgery, you will all know that is very rarely present. But however, we come across many cases where the stapes foot plate is indeed present. So you could have, you give a score like this, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, depending upon whether there is involvement. So how do you differentiate between these two? Now, EHNS has got extra and complicated stage 3. But here, extracurricular complication is given two points. Two points with facial palsy, labyrinthine fistula, mastoiditis, basal abscess, and intracranial complications are given four points, like meningitis, brain, or sigmoids, and a thrombosis. So <coughs> you could add like that. So if you have uh, early cholestatoma, one point, then there is ossicular erosion, you give two points. And then if there is labyrinthine fistula, you give through two. So it's just two plus one plus one, two, five points like that. So how do you compare them? So here, um, so this is the staging system here. This is the AOS HNO. So you have the class one cholestatoma, stage one attic, two cholestatoma, two or more sites, three cholestatoma complications, four, and a very complex system. Whereas in Coley, it is much more easier. So if you have a classification sum between one and three, it is stage one, four and eight is stage two, and eight and above is stage four. Think for example, if you have an extensive cholestatoma, stage three, Go back to the last picture, then malleus, uh, incus eroded, so you 3 plus 2, 5, and then you have a facial pass, you give 2, 7, so it is still stage 2, get it? But whereas if there is intracranial complication, you add to that 4, it becomes immediately over 8. 
So this is actually, if you want to follow a classification system that you and I could be um, clear about, we should follow the Cauley classification system. Okay. Now we also have to do a, um, it is now generally appreciated that you do a, a CT scan for most cases of cholesterol. I mean, agree, there are people who don't do it for many reasons. Some people feel that, you know, we are so good, we can go inside and find out what is wrong. There are people like me who want to do it, but don't do it because of the radiation issues. And there are people who do it for every single case because there's a teaching system. But however, you have to understand that you are, it is so much important to find out hidden areas, ossicles, mastered acids, facial canal, external aortic canal, semicircular canal, Peter's apex, and other variant anatomy. Now, when do you actually operate? Do you see, you're seeing two pictures here. One picture is there. You can see that there is a, what looks like a dry ear. You can see the drum that is gone inside. A little bit of blackish discoloration or blue, pinkish discoloration there. You can see the malleus. You can see the incus fully intact and possibly the stapes. And here you can see another one where it's a dull looking drum, anterior part retracted, attic retraction. Do you actually operate on these people? I mean, it, you should, you must always understand that cholesterol surgery is not a cosmetic surgery. You don't operate just because you want something to look good. Whatever be the picture here, the decision to operate should be made on whether the hearing loss is over 30 dB, if there is a discharge, fundus or retraction pocket not visible, or the definite disease on imaging or the presence of complication. This should be the reason why we should operate. For example, you find this patient here, this one, and you get about 25 dB hearing loss. There is no discharge. I mean, you simply should not operate. But then you find this patient who's got that kind of hearing loss, but 45 dB hearing loss, you will operate. You know why? Because if you operate on somebody with a 30 dB, with this kind of disease and dry ear, you will only get 30 dB and dry ear. So you're actually giving no perceptible change to the patient. And there should never be an Dr. indication. Manoj, can surgery. I, can yes. I ask you a question here at this point? Yeah. Now, uh, looking at the different criteria, you were saying to, to operate a patient. Mm. Uh, one thing is, of course, uh, you, do you do a CT scan for every patient or a patient with even mild cholesterol, you think? No, no, no. And I say that's what I mentioned. I mean, see, if I had something called a cone beam CT, which is Correct. not very good now, I would actually do it on every patient. Because the reason why we do it is because, see, if I see this patient, I mean, this patient is pretty straightforward, okay. But look at this patient. That patient, if I would not know if there is a disease extending into the sinus tympani, right? Correct, correct. So these are the decisions. So imagine that if I'm operating on somebody, the other year is really bad. If somebody's got a 70 dB SN loss in one year, and this year has got 45 dB. Correct. I would like to tell the patient that how much of hearing improvement would I give you? And the presence of a stapes superstructure would be a definite indicator that I should be able to give him at least 30 dB here. Isn't it? Okay. Now so, on, this point, on this point, we have a question from Dr. Subin Anthony. Okay. Uh, the, uh, uh, he, he asked that the patient often asks whether the hearing is going to come back to normal after such a surgery. What do you actually tell them? I will come to that uh, when we go Later. to the topic. But okay, and just one the, last question before we the, proceed. Do you also believe in doing an MRI diffusion? I will also come to that later, Manish. That is yeah. the later part of my talk. Yeah. Now, uh, this one, the question to Subin asked is that, uh, should what kind of a guarantee will give? No, if you ask me what I will tell people is that, generally, the, there is a ballpark figure. If you have a cholesterol, especially an early cholesterol, you will generally land up with the same hearing after surgery as you have before surgery. I mean, that's, that, that much you can tell people. So which means that if you have mild hearing loss and if you operate, the patient will only have a mild hearing loss post-operatively. It is very rare that they can actually have improvement or deterioration. So generally, I mean, this is a ballpark figure. This is not an absolutely accurate figure. But your aim should be able to at least retain the hearing that you have. You should never operate in and reduce hearing. That should be your, that, I hope that answers Subin's question. Yeah. Now, what, again, this, this is exactly what I was coming to. What is the minimum expectation that a patient needs with surgery? A patient wants a dry ear, okay? So you can do your most fantastic surgery. But if it continues to discharge, even if the hearing is improved, a patient is never going to be happy. Now, the hearing has to be at least 30 dB. 
Now, if you have hearing, which is um, 45 dB after surgery, there's going to be no difference at all. So hearing has to be at least 30 dB. And thirdly, you should be able to carry out activities of daily life without limitation. So you must understand that I'm talking about early disease. Let us not forget that. You now somebody with the intracranial complication with the extensive cholesterol and Peter's apex, these things don't matter. My everything that I'm talking today is going to be related to my topic, which is we are talking on people with early squamous disease. Correct. Which is stage one uh, in the, um, in the uh, um, colleague classification Correct. or stage one or two in the um, JAWS classification. Now, Imagine, look at this like this. There is a patient who comes to you with a limited post superior traction pocket and good hearing. Mm -hmm. There is history of discharge. I'm going to run this video. Minish, you have to tell me how clear it is, okay? Because I have yeah. downgraded the video quality so that it looks okay on the on transcription. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so what we do here? This is a fa this is what this is my stock approach to cholesterol. So here you have a patient right squamous disease. Um, we have done a mastrodectomy, and you can see already here that uh, there is a uh, uh, incus there. Um, so in this patient, the ossicleage is intact. So we have identified the facial nerve. You can see the, uh, the pink color of the facial nerve there. You can see where the arrow is. Yes. Are you able to see my cursor? We are seeing it. We are seeing the cursor, yes. Cursor. And then uh, we go right in front of so the... Can you be a little louder, a little louder. Okay. So we go right in front of the facial nerve. And what I do at that point of time is to push some strips of gel foam into the facial recess. Because what happens to the gel form is that if the retraction pocket is not adherent to the middle ear, it will actually push it out and you can do a dissection later on lateral to the, um, to the gel form and medial to the retraction pocket. See, mm -hmm. here. So we are actually dissecting above the gel form and under the retraction pocket. And because you see gel form underneath, you are kind of reasonably certain that there is no disease medial to the gel form. You get it? So, so what you're trying to say is you push the gel form from the facial recess ah, into, the, into, the, uh, sinus, yeah. into the facial recess. Yes, yes. Into the facial recess through the yes. um, uh, posterior branch. Correct, correct, correct. And so now, so along is, with the gel form, in case there are any pieces of epithelium, that will also help in getting them out. Is that also think, one of the No, this will this will happen only if there is very early disease. You have a retraction pocket. You have hearing loss. Okay. Now, if the gel form is not able to push it out, mm -hmm. uh, let me just pause the video for a little while here. Uh, now here. Now, if the gel form is not able to push it out, then we are in for trouble here. Okay. That means that there is epithelium that is stuck onto the middle ear, where you'll have to go inside and, and, and you know, maybe sometimes convert it into canal wall down or whatever. But if the gel form is pushing out the entire attraction pocket, you are safe here. Correct, correct, if, correct, correct. See, which indirectly implies that the epithelium is still not stuck to the middle ear mucosa and the middle ear mucosa are reasonably uh, healthy. I mean, this, is, this can only be done with that. So the, if you push in gel form through the posterior tibnotomy and if it lifts out the epithelium, then your safety factor in doing such a procedure. See, when we do such a procedure, your main fear is that would you be leaving epithelium inside? If the retraction pocket gets pushed out by, by gel form, you're reasonably safe. Now here, there's some, one more thing that I've done. Uh, I put in a grommet. I mean, a titanium grommet in the anterior superior quadrant will generally aim to ventilate the ear. Here we have done nothing. We have just lifted it off, put a piece of cartilage and closed. This can only be done when the ossicleation is intact when there is a very early disease in the um, uh, facial recess. Now, if you go back to the classification of Coli, it is stage two. You get what I mean? Right, right. Uh, the attic is normal. The, the, only the uh, facial recess is normal. Yes. Now, now uh, we shall go to the next one. Would you put in a grommet in most of these no, patients? No, no, no. no, no. Only if there is something like this, what we have seen, because otherwise it can be seen. If you want to support the whole timan membrane, you it can't let you can't put in a grommet. If the anterior part of the past tensa is on, nor, normal, if the anterior part of the middle ear is normal, and it's only the posterior part of the retracted. In the healing process, a grommet helps. Now, if you one more small question: Is there any role of endoscopic tympanoplasty in this? We are we are uh, coming to that later. Sure. We are coming to that later. 
so okay. you are um, you are a good moderator you are preempting everything that i am saying okay now <laughs> so here um, there is i am i am going through a, a, a small uh, ex- example here so here a patient with a squamous let me let me go to the magnifying thing so a patient with left squamous disease right great to retraction so you have a left mastoidectomy cartilage tendinoplasty and we do a right uh, trial meningotomy here this is a patient so this is 14 at 2015 there you can see the date she was 14 years old and there was this big retraction pocket in the left ear the tm was adherent now we did a tympanoplasty in the left ear because that had poorer hearing a cartilage tympanoplasty and put in just a grommet in the right ear see and you see the how the grommet has filled out the retraction pocket and see what has happened to the hearing the hearing improved from 40 db in the right ear to almost um, 25 db and the in the left ear which way we did retinoplasty and the right ear we did not operate because that did not have a hearing loss at all so it was preoperatively 25 post operatively 25 so this is the reason why we say we cannot operate on ears that don't have retraction i mean you do nothing here on the left side however there is a retraction also but there is 40 db hearing loss but by operating on this particular patient doing a cartilage tympanoplasty same procedure that i mentioned in this surgery uh, even after um, we shall go to that and this is uh, in 2018 that is um, 2016 that is one year later the grommet is extruded the retraction pocket is recurred so you can see that yeah, the right ear the left ear operative ear still seems to be all right the hearing in 2016 that is a year later it is still 25 db in the other ear and 25 db in the operative ear so 40 to 25 in the left ear and remains at 25 in the right ear right ear and we are just following up with the yearly audiograms you can see 2015 the pt otoscopy we have done 2016 2020 and there is only observation no medication you can see that we have not given any antibiotic no drops no anti allergy management because that is all not required for these people okay and now wait and 6 years later now yes. this is 2020 20 so uh-huh. here you have the retraction pocket in the right ear still remains like that the left ear the cartilage remains all right and the hearing is still same correct so this is 6 years after the primary surgery 2014 to 2020 right so so here just imagine now if you had gone and operated the right ear what change would be have happened i mean i i put in a grommet yes but i did not do it because i just did it because we are operating the left ear anyway but i think even without a grommet nothing would have happened to the right ear at all so by seeing a retraction pocket we should not go and operate so what you're trying to say is when you operated the left ear simultaneously you also put a grommet in the right ear the right ear so the right it was not a separate procedure no 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 it's not separate procedure see left ear separate. i operated only because there was 40 db hearing loss yeah so Otherwise, we have would not have operated yes hmm. yeah, so one is of course a, a genuine request again to maybe get your mic a little closer because some people are not able to hear it okay if okay uh, now the, there is a one question uh, two questions which we have from uh, dr shinoj Uh, uh one question was won't the grommet interfere with the post op uh, mri in case there is the patient requires one there is okay. a question from dr vijay jadhav he asked that uh, is it not better to clear the ventilation pathway uh, prior to uh, putting a grommet in these patients in which you are having a recurrent retraction um i mean uh, this ventilation pathway thing has often been discussed see there is exactly what we do see this particular patient there is only the anterior part of the drum is normal correct correct the posterior part is retracted the ossicular chain is intact correct and the attic is normal okay now when we lift up the tympanic membrane intact to the posterior tympanotomy using gel form what we are essentially doing is we are clearing the ventilation pathways correct there is nothing wrong with the attic if there was something wrong with the attic we would definitely have done now grommet interfering with mri see this grommet how much would it stay it would stay maximum 9 months 10 months a year we are not going to do an mri within that period because our fear of a recurrence see there have been reports i have recently the paper where they found out a recurrence um 25 years later but we wouldn't expect a recurrence happening within one year i mean one second thing is that a titanium grommet is mri friendly uh, you can always do imaging with a titanium grommet but here in this particular case um this titanium grommet by the time you want to do an mri later whether when you are fearing a possible recurrence would be um two years later if you i mean if you want to do a second look i would definitely do a second look for this patient but if you want to do it it is two years later 
but mm-hmm. um uh, by then the grommet would have all is easily gone so if you look at the my right here the regular follow up holds holds a vital role in these patients to know how they are progressing if you want to do a limited uh, cholestatoma intercanal wall procedure um you must have follow up this patient okay. if you see this 2020 february i have operated on 2014 yeah. i will continue to follow up i mean i'll follow up forever if possible we tell them to come every year but it is absolutely imperatively important when you do something like this you have to have follow up right okay. now the question is if you have a person with a retraction pocket uh similar thing but if the very contracted antrum will you be able to do the same thing i mean i'm sure that somebody must be thinking like that now here um we will see this particular approach so here there was a patient when similar kind of disease or retraction pocket when we started off itself the 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 thing started bleeding so we don't have any antrum to play around with so what we do is that we actually go through the middle ear now because we cannot do a posterior tibiotomy we correct out the posterior posterior superior canal wall and you can see that the middle ear is all right and then put in a cartilage support see uh, the we cannot do the similar kind of procedure that we did earlier in the right side i mean we did everything what we did in the right side but here we are going to the canal side now if you ask me can we do it on the other side also but if i look at it if i can push up the epithelium with the gel form nothing like it. i would be much happier doing doing my action plan 1 rather than action plan 2 the only reason i did not do it in this case because i cannot do a posterior tibiotomy in such a small mastoid otherwise it is the same procedure for the same condition in a two different ways but uh, doing a posterior tibiotomy would be actually safer from my point of view now if you are somebody who would be much more comfortable doing a posterior canal wall curating and um, taking out the pocket under direct vision perfectly good i am not saying that you have to do a posterior tibiotomy you should never be dogmatic in science you should make sure that um, whatever you doing for the good of the patient my right. concern about doing the second procedure is that when we curate out the posterior superior canal wall there is some change that we are making to the mass to the middle ear architecture which i don't like so my first procedure actually is more anatomy friendly than the second procedure mm-hmm. now uh, one small question here sorry to interrupt you oh no issues yes, yes. yeah. one is of course uh, the two questions one is is there any role of uh, valsal was manual or uh, any ventilation in in these patients post operatively to try to maybe ventilate the middle ear a little ah, bit uh, now and, um, uh, and the second question is of course from my side when you have such a cartilage put in this retraction pockets all the time mm. uh, or any uh, does it really hamper the hearing to a certain extent we have follow up here i will show that to you see mm-hmm. i have i have used large piece of cartilage a full thickness cartilage in most of my patients we have not found any great deterioration in hearing ability i mean agreed i am i am i mean i do understand there may be a 5 db 6 db here and there but correct. we are actually having a small compromise we are trying to make something safer correct thereby compromising a little bit on hearing but not like 15 20 db gap okay get me it is like 5 6 db maybe so here if you look at this patient so this is a patient who straya she has got hearing loss both ears Uh, i am going to uh, magnify something here right side is great one retraction left side is posterior superior cordon with perforation rini is negative both ears now we have done uh, a tibia plastic you can see here and that is a post operative picture that's a pre operative picture great to retraction retraction pocket cholestatum on the left side that is a result so can you see that hearing improvement from uh, 55 yeah. db to 30 db yes yeah. not a great deal of improvement and that is a, a picture she was 6 years old right side again we put in a grommet during the primary procedure left side the graft is intact that is a notes so posterior superior cordon cholestatoma incurs long process necrosis anterior attic free of disease i mean you talked about the ventilation pathways we do examine the the ventilation pathways cholestatoma sac seen extending into the aditus um tm flap elevated we also looked with endoscope so question of should we do an endoscopic examination i am not an endoscopic surgeon but i always use the endoscope to make sure that this is free we keep the conchal cartilage and then um, thing and this is the follow up this is 2020 and if you look at the last uh, uh, wait, wait a minute and that is a uh, that is 2000 the surgery was done in 2017 and that is in 2020 and there is um, uh, the right side is okay there is a little retraction pocket but you can see the cone of light anteriorly here 
there is a small little retraction developing anteriorly. Can you see that? Yeah. And that is one of the trouble that you can have with the large cartilage. You can never be watertight here. Um, but retraction occurred exactly where the cartilage was deficit. Deficit. So that is something that you know you have to be. You, you're, you're not a magician. You you sometimes right. do mistakes, but then you're fo following them up. Uh, the hearing remains all right. There is slight deterioration hearing, but um, it it is something that needs a little bit more follow up. Um, frequently, maybe an MRI to find out. I mean, you asked about whether you do a non EPA DW. So that retraction is so far harmless. It is 2020, it is now three years past, but we still have to watch for it. And if there's any trouble, we should not forget to go back in. So this is the danger in operating on patients with early squamous disease. You have to have follow up. Right. So can now, we ask a few questions? Oh, yeah. You can stop me whenever. Yes. Now, there's one question just uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Granthi Krishnamurthy. Uh, they ask, what do you do for a past flaccid or retraction pocket with no hearing loss and asymptomatic? Do you leave it alone or just observe you guys, it? You guys are preempting all my slides. My next slide is on that. Okay, then I come to another important question. Okay. Uh, that in a limited retraction pocket, this is from Dr. Ganesh. Hmm. Uh, he says that, do you really need a mastoidectomy with a facial recess? Because he felt that the facial recess retraction cases are more severe adhesive cases. And putting a cartilage may cover the round window and having a hearing impact. But I think we spoke uh, about you, that. You showed my, I showed my follow-up over seven years okay. and there's no hearing improvement. I, I, I'm, see, it is always important to understand what work, works well for you and what works for you in most of the cases after many years. Right. You can't do a surgery and after a year say that, wow, what a great surgery surgeon I am. That's, that's not how it works. You should be right. able to do a particular technique. You should be able to follow these patients for 5, 10, 15 years. And your then, video has hung up, Dr. Manoj. I can't see your video. You, it's, it's picture is a bit frozen. I can hear your sound, but... Um, do we have a problem with the bandwidth? I think no, I'm not so sure. Um... Can you hear me now? Just because sometimes there is a bandwidth issue here in the evening. Everybody is watching internet. Hello? Hello? So we can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Okay, fine. Yeah, I think uh, Manish bad. got disconnected. Disconnected, okay. No, no, no. There is, see, because I think everybody is sitting at home and um, uh, I think watching uh, all those things on the internet, uh, movies and all that nowadays at Netflix, sometimes you have a bandwidth issue here. Now, somebody asked a question, what will you do with just attic erosion and normal hearing? Minish, are you still there? No, I think so. You will have to again uh, log in. I'll just speak to him, sir. Hello. You will have to log in again, sir. Me? No, 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 no. I am talking to Dr. Uh, Minis. Sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Fluticon F. Yeah, I think so. You're back. Okay. Are we all right now? You'll have to make him admin, I think, Shishir. Yeah, yeah, sir. Sure. Hello? Is it okay? Can we start? Dr. Minish is there, sir, but uh, I don't know. 
do we wait for him for five minutes yes sir i think so he has to start the video he has not started the video more people are joining in i think uh in the meantime sir you can take a question there is a qu there is a question that in case of retraction uh, this is from dr uh, vaidik uh, in case of retraction in young patients do you consider nasal endoscopy to rule out et blockage by adenoid um, um no 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 see we we treat adenoids on their own merit i don't think uh, when you when you do a surgery for a cholestatoma you can't say a cholestatoma was because of adenoids that doesn't work that way but however as a young child with um, squam squamous disease and there is adenoids um mouth breathing snoring and all that and not responding to inhaled steroid and stuff like that we will definitely operate on that at the same time but i don't think um you can call this adenoid as a cause for the otitis media to either to happen or to recur you will have to do that if if adenoids demand treatment and that you can do it of course at the same time but i don't think um because in any case we'll be examining the patient we'll be examining them fully so uh, to do an adenoidectomy or to examine the adenoids in every patient with squamous disease if there are no symptoms i don't think it really matters so we can continue i will just try to connect dr minish okay you can continue okay now we somebody asked me a question what will happen if there is a when you have only atic disease there is another question that was asked what would you do if there is why do you want to operate a mastoid open the mastoid i'll have an answer for both of them you don't have to open the mastoid at all times so here there's a patient with a small limited atic cholestatum and i've done an endoral approach uh, we put retractors in the scrotum is exposed and um, the canal plasty is done so that we can see the whole tympanic membrane um you can see the entire uh, canal we are exposing the attic by drilling there we are carefully dissecting out the the epithelium under vision and you can see clearly the head of the malleus and the body of the incus underneath the retracting pocket uh, you can actually smoothen out that uh, scrotum for more exposure you can harvest tragal cartilage uh take out the perichondrium and here you can see let me go back just a second there you can see here that um, the, that area is so clear can you see that you can see that that's the anterior pathway posterior pathway everything is all right and there you keep the cartilage i shall once again go a little bit back when i froze it you could not see the video so you are seeing that everything is clear and you can keep a piece of cartilage in the scrotum keep perichondrium over that and close the tympanic brain over so here the past tensor is completely intact so this is one of the cases where you can actually operate on a early cholestatoma of the attic where there is no bone destruction where there is no um, uh, you know extension to the mastoid but here you are seeing see, the discharge is because of the granulation tissue here of course you can do it um, you, only if you are absolutely certain the disease has not gone to the uh, mastoid and here imaging is so useful if you find a patient with just scrotum destruction and no disease in the mastoid antrum you can do this procedure where you can just go through the canal endoral incision canal plasty take out the scrotum drill it till you are very sure make sure all your ventilation pathway is all right and then repair it off with cartilage uh, minish are you back now uh, this is a pictorial representation of what you can see see here um, this is the endoral approach and that is the disease and so you can take it away and you can use multiple piece of cartilage if you want to repair it this is a endoral atichotomy approach for uh, dealing with such disease through the antrum and here we are not operating or not entering into the mastoid at all so this is see and how do you know there is atic disease i mean this is sometimes people always ask me now here you can see that that is the scrotum okay so you can see this is a, um, a coronal view of the um, of the uh, of the mastoid antrum or the pterostome of the temporal bone that's the internal auditory meatus that is a cochlea that's a semicircular canal superior semicircular canal lateral semicircular canal you can see this black bone with a uh, mark of the facial nerve and that is attic and that is a scrotum the scrotum has to be completely sharp in a normal 
case. So if the scrotum is not sharp, it is blunted, then you can almost certainly be sure that there is a disease in the prophylactic space or in the attic. Say so there like that. But however, the, that is the axial images. So coronal images will show you much better detail of the scrotum than the axial images. So if you want to really make out if the scrotum is intact or how much of disease is there posterior to the scrotum, you need to do a scan which shows you not only the axial images because that will also show you what kind of mastoid you have, but if you must do a coronal reconstruction. So here there's a patient with the attic disease and uh, that was done uh, many years back and here you can see the disease, the post-operative result in many years later. Now, um, once again about imaging, see here the importance of imaging is this. So imagine that this particular year, like I said earlier, see here is the normal year, normal looking year on the left side. Uh, you have the malleus, the incus and the stapes, that's the vestibule, the basal turn of the cochlea round window, the posterior semicircular canal. Now, if this year has got a and hearing loss, if I'm operating on this year, and if you find the articular process of the incus and the stapes and the stapes crude are intact, you can reasonably assure that this particular right ear, there would be hearing improvement. Uh, and now here, this is again, so you have another uh, picture here, what I said here. See, this is the sharp scutum in the normal, completely normal attic. That's a malleus head um, and the incus and that's attic. That's a scrotum. The scrotum is sharp. But here, when the scrotum is blunt and there is opacification of the prosaic space. So if you have a blunt scrotum and a loss of black air between the malleus and the outer attic wall, then you can be sure that the patient has got an attic cholestatoma. Now, it is this kind of a patient that we have operated just now. So if you want to do that particular surgery, you have to be certain about two things. One, you must be certain that disease has not gone to the mastoid. Two, that the attic alone is involved and the attic has to be involved. Sometimes you can get a granulation from an external canal and they can mimic an attic disease. So if you find a granulation in the attic area, it is imperative that you do imaging to find out that you really do have a justification to operate. So um, now here, um, uh, there is a patient with a semicircular canal fistula. There's a patient with a cartilage reconstruction done, which you want to risk the cholesterol. Here there is a small little uh, cholesterol in the scrotum, but there is also something that has gone down the hypotympanum. So you have to have these things um, uh, to find out what is wrong. Now, there was a question that was asked a little bit earlier about non-EPI DW image. So imagine that the patient has got a particular condition like that. You have a mastoid that is filled with some soft tissue. And then you, are, you do your non-EPA DW imaging. You find that that area is bright. That is cholesterol. Can you see that? So non-EPA DW imaging can pick up cholesterol as small as two millimeters in size. Now, sometimes, sometimes when you're operating, seeing especially a person with a post-operative cavity and you're not very sure there's recidivism or just post-operative granulation, you can use non-EPI. But for the primary diagnosis of cholesterol, uh, I think non-EPA DW imaging is a rather big overkill. Now, uh, now here, uh, there is an, suppose you have a condition where the disease is there in the attic, but normal antrum and intact stapes, and this is what you do. So here, we have done a mastoidectomy. Again, questions can be asked whether should you do a mastoidectomy at all, and that's entirely up to one. I am certain that the mastoidectomy doesn't do any harm, even though people uh, do um, talk about it occasionally. So you can see here that the middle ear as such is normal. The disease is only in the attic. So you can see here that we are actually drilling out the attic there completely. Also doing a posterior temperotomy and this time connecting the posterior temperotomy to the attic. So can you see that? So here the posterior temperotomy is connected to the attic. The reason why we do is that there is a disease in the attic we certainly don't want to be leading behind disease between the middle ear and the attic. And for that, by doing a posterior terminotomy like what I did earlier, simply doesn't work. But when you want to do such a thing, you must be certain that there is no articulation between the incus and the stapes. If the, there is articulation between the incus and stapes, by doing that procedure, you can touch the incus and that vibration of your burr can 
go on to the uh, step is and produce shearing of the basal membrane of the cochlea and produce sense neural hearing loss. Here, um, if you notice one more thing that we did was we not only did we put a scutum reconstruction with the attic, but we also through the posterior temporotomy we have put in a small piece of cartilage between the mobile in stapes and the cartilage that is used to cover the scutum. The biggest advantage of a posterior temporotomy here, see, can you see that here? We have gone through the posterior temporotomy. See, when you have a posterior temporotomy, you can actually place the graft and then do the ossicle reconstruction. And the second thing is that if you want to do a second look, you can go post orally and examine without opening into the ear at all, making no canal incision, making no ex approach. You can go through the post hypnotomy and examine that, that area that you operated and make sure that there's no recidivistic disease. Yeah, Dr. Manu, there are two questions here. Yeah. One is, can you hear me? I can hear you. Your voice yeah. is kind of. One is, uh, hmm. yeah, I, th I think the corona is all over the place. Uh, is the post impenetrometry help in aeration of the middle ear? It, it certainly must, right? See, but the important thing is that when you have a aeration issue, it is generally due to mucosal folds and um, retractions, which are which anyway you are right. clearing off with the procedure that we are doing. Um, whether right. post impenetrometry actually helps in healing or not, I re I am not really sure. There are not enough literature, not enough papers to prove that. Okay. Now, and the other uh, question was, hmm. tell me, hello, uh, is, the, is, is there a landmark? Huh. When you would decide, you would like to do an attic reconstruction. I'm sorry, I didn't hear anything. So far from you. Can you type that out to me, please? Can you type that out to me? Minish, can you just type it out for me, please? Hello? I think the sir got disconnected, sir, actually. No, no, Minish, I think, is having some network issues. Yeah. What is the question? Has somebody written it out? Has somebody typed it out, the question? Uh, there are quite a few questions, sir, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think um, uh, one of the questions that was asked, um, one of the questions I think I partly heard what Minish told me is that is there a landmark to do a post determinatory? Was it right? I don't know what they ask. See, the post determinatory landmark at any place, whether you do it for cochlear implant or whatever, is the facial nerve. So, you see, um, I agree that. Um, whatever I do may not be uh, everybody's cup of tea. There may be people who would like to do it through the antrum, might like to do an anticotomy, a white canal plastic. So what, what I was asking you, Dr. Manoj, is, is there a landmark where you would say uh, you would like to reconstruct it? I mean, when you have exposed adequate part of the incus, you would say, okay, fine, I have exposed too much of incus, I have to reconstruct the attic. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You, see, you, you always, if the scutum is eroded, you have to reconstruct the attic. There is no question about it. And whether it is a one millimeter erosion of, or five millimeter doesn't matter. If there is scotum erosion, you have to reconstruct. You cannot leave behind that and say, hope that the ear become all right. See here, Sorry. you can see to these two pictures of the same patient pre-operative, post-operative. Again, many years later, there's a patient with attic scotoma. The uh, the most of the past tense are remaining normal. You can see a few air bubbles there, and that is the reconstruction that was done, full cartilage. And here you can see the um, the hearing results after. See that is a preoperative picture with a retraction pocket, discharge and granulations. Postoperative many years later, and the hearing preoperatively around uh, 55 dB. Postoperatively around 45 dB. Not a great deal of hearing improvement, but 40. If you can give 40 dB hearing improvement to one year, uh, you are essentially avoiding hearing aid use in that particular year. If the other year is okay. So, uh, see, this is what I said. See, when you have chronic ear disease, uh, squamous type, 
it is absolutely imperative that you operate before it is too late. You can't wait for them to develop 40, 50, 60 dB hearing loss and then operate. If they have no hearing loss, great. They have mild hearing loss, fantastic. But uh, waiting for them to have a lot of hearing loss, you are not going to give them great hearing improvement over, many, over a long period of time. See, this is... Uh, this point, Dr. Manoj, there, there are two questions. Of, yeah. One from uh, Dr. Yawar Mohammed and from uh, Dr. Vinayak. Mm -hmm. uh, they ask is uh, uh, your take on uh, a Valsalva's maneuver mm. for great two or three retraction. Is there any harm or is there any benefit of it in your experience? Yeah, yeah it, is, it is definitely something. See, for example, the left, left ear. You can see the left ear here. See this left ear, Manish? You see the yes, left ear. Yes. yes. How would a Valsalva maneuver help in not making it worse, it probably will, right? Correct. So but you need routinely for all your cases, uh, Valsalvas or not really? Uh, uh, yeah, I tell them to do it. But yes. see, but if I ask, if you ask me whether do I have proof that it works, I don't have. In fact, there is no proof in any world literature that by doing Valsalvas maneuver regularly, you can ever revert a retraction pocket. That's that. We are losing the Pardon? Yeah, no, I, I think that's the important message that uh, Valsalva might not reverse the disease. It can right. maybe help in some extent, but not in really massive reversing control. the disease. We don't have data, but I absolutely no harm. I fully agree with people who say that you can do it, but that's perfectly fine. Fair enough. Now, um, now if there is, now late, uh, I showed you before, if there is stapes and without stapes, so we can have two different techniques with or without stapes. I, I'll show you that. There are two article techniques that you can do here. So here again, the mastoid antrum is uninvolved. We're talking about early squamous disease here. We're lifting the refraction pocket. You can see the stapes there, there. You can see the stapes. Can you see that? The yeah, stapes is there. Yeah, we can see um, it, yeah. We have taken a small piece of the uh, incus and we have made a small articular facet for the stapes head, a little groove for the malleus. And we have kept that there and articulated the stapes, I'm uh, sorry, the incus between the mobile stapes and the malleus. If, however, the stay piece is not present, so here again, this is a technique where we have um, done a post it to me that we have not entered. We have made sure that there is no disease deep in the facial races. There is no stay piece at all. So we have cleared out all the disease. We're hoping that everything is fine. We have lifted out the retraction pocket. Incus is totally necros. There is no stay piece uh, superstructure at all. But we do have a malleus. Right now, we have cleared all the blocks and we have put in a cartilage there and put in a graft. Uh, and then we have taken a small incus. We are shaping it like a small wedge. We are putting it between the, the mobile foot plate and the cartilage through the posterior tibinotomy. I will run it to you once again. Yeah, yeah. The last part wasn't very clear. So here we have made a small strut of cartilage. And there you can see that. See, let me freeze it there. See, what we have done is we have taken the small wedge-shaped piece of incus. We have put the smaller part of the wedge into the foot plate and that the flat portion under the cartilage. Now, when you place a incus on a mobile foot plate, you must understand a few things. One, if it is loose, it is not going to work. If it is tight, it's not going to work. If it is tight, not only it is not going to work, but you also have a dislocation possibility where the foot plate can subluxate into the vestibule and cause sensorineural hearing loss. So the only way in which you can do it actually properly is by looking at it when you're doing it. And it's very difficult to look at it through the canal, even though you can, of course, do it. But here, this is one useful technique if you can do a post anatomy. I mean, these days, I think, because a lot of people are doing cochlear implants, I think post anatomy should be under the armament area of many people. And if you, even if you're not doing a cochlear implant, by doing post anatomies in such cases, will make you a better cochlear implant surgeon. Correct, correct. It is very, very important to make sure that you know where the facial nerve is, don't damage the cauda, don't damage the outratic wall, don't damage the posterior superior canal wall. And doing these techniques will help you to become not only a better autologist, but also a better cochlear implant surgeon in the future. So here we have shown you two techniques, one where the incus was taken and repositioned between the mobile stapes and the malleus. And the second one where we have done a posterior terminotomy and kept a incus between the foot plate and the uh, cartilage. The important thing being that it should never be too tight or too loose, which means that if you give it a little knock, it should fall away. But if it is uh, too tight, it's really dangerous because it 
can cause hearing loss and can cause sometimes hearing even deterioration. Is Correct. that clear, Manish? There is a small question here hmm. from uh, one Dr. Vinayak. He seems to be really engrossed and active in your talk, you know. <laughs> uh, okay, with due regards to Dr. Vinayak, he asked that at times the cholesterol can mask the hearing as has been shown in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It always does. So, so how reliable is PTA in your practice? Do you really think that you have to give a, a little error margin in cases of these patients when it comes to the sound conduction? Uh, when that's a, it's in fact a brilliant question. I'll come to that later. In fact, I have a slide on that later. In general, in general, uh, an audiogram is more reliable in general. But you must the, so the caveat is that if you have somebody with a really good hearing and you can look through the canal and see that the deep retraction pocket and obviously the stapes or the incus is not there. You know, be really careful about these things. See, we are, I mean, again, I'm talking about early disease, right? We're not talking about extensive cholesterol. Sometimes you can have a canal full of cholesterol and normal hearing. And if we know for sure that that cholesterol is going to be communicating to the foot plate area and that will be transmitting sound. And that, that there is no doubt, but we're talking about early disease here. If you find a deep retraction pocket and normal hearing, you should actually leave it alone because you're not going to do any better job than that particular traction pocket of improving hearing. You will again operate only if that's why my first slide that is a cosmetic, it's not a cosmetic surgery because if you have a deep retraction pocket lying on the foot plate and giving good hearing, all you need to do is watch. You're going to watch anyway if you operate. You, you know, in these cases, even when you don't operate, you watch. The important thing is don't mess with something that is acting well. I hope that answers your question, Vinayak. Yes. That's a really brilliant question. Is one question on my, on, from my side, when I saw this uh, ossicular reconstruction, uh, are there also guidelines where you would not use an implant or a prosthesis or you don't like to use a prosthesis at all in these cases? Now, in general, I mean, that's also a brilliant question. In general, uh, see, I have a preferences for what I will use in, when I do ear surgery. Uh, the worldwide data says that autographed bone is the best thing to be used when there is active disease. Like, for example, here in this particular case, there is, um, there is granulation, I mean, there is edematous mucosa. Nothing works like autographed bone or autographed cartilage. Now, cartilage, uh, I am a little bit skeptical because there was a time that I used to use a lot of, lot of cartilage, but, but my follow up, like you said, is like for 5, 10, 15 years. Um, I have seen more cartilage having deterioration postoperatively than bone. I mean, this may more be... More cartilage? No, more cartilage, terminal uh, osteoplasty having deterioration, long-term deterioration. deterioration. Over the long term. Uh, over the long term. And this is actually occurred in many studies worldwide. I mean, people have done 15, 20 year follow-up. I'm not talking about two or three year follow-ups. So I am, t I tend generally to use more, more um, bone. But imagine, see, suppose, for example, this particular case what I've done on the foot plate. Imagine that the other ear had poor hearing minish. I would have used cartilage. You know why? Because the cartilage, there is a lesser chance of the foot plate being subluxated than the, uh, than bone. The, the bone. So their safety is actually more better. But again, there again, I would have done something. I would not have done osseoplasty at all primarily. I would have let it be. And then go in two years later, no recurrence, then done a cycle pass. And stage it later on. Uh, if the middle ear is normal, if you have a pristine virgin middle ear, you operated two, two years back, you've gone inside seeing a healthy, absolutely normal middle ear. Or if you're doing it for, a, um, for somebody without any active disease, um, with the congenital malformation, for example, it is actually really, really good to use titanium. Titanium. But wherever I have used titanium in the presence of disease, my experience has not been good. And I feel bad because the patient has spent so much money for a process. We do it in the presence of active disease. And three or four, more, four years later, you get an extrusion. It's not a very pleasant thing for the patient. I have a similar experience here. Yeah, that's why I, I asked. I, yeah. And I think most of us yeah. Yeah. do it. Watch one, last, of yeah, one last question before you proceed ahead. Is that to support the graft, which you have been showing, the cartilage, hmm. uh, do you use uh, uh, anything else to reconstruct uh, to support the graft, like gel, just gel foam or anything more? No, no, no. Just cartilage and um, uh, your fascia or pericondyle, whatever. So gel form, I, by in general, I would not use a gel form in the middle ear, unless of course okay. I'm doing a, okay. a trans canal transpiration procedure. So fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, please go on. Yeah. Okay. Now here, see, this is a particular patient. You can see what this is. So here you have a person with uh, 20 dB hearing loss, 
there is a big retraction pocket there is a meningosclerosis in the sorry meningosclerosis in the anterior quadrant and you have some kind of a normal hearing 22 db hearing would you like to operate on this no you would not like to but you, when you look at the posterior superior retraction area you see a part where you cannot see the fundus of the retraction pocket and if there is discharge from that you would like to go and operate now if you are uh, operating on such a patient and then if you are not sure of disease clearance what will you do so here um, uh, we are tried to use see here we are in this I mean, for a patient like this we have done that and then we have found that lot of epithelium is getting stuck there we can use ktp laser to remove cholestatum i mean here again uh, kt there are advantages of ktp laser unlike a diathermy it doesn't right. use a lot of collateral damage there is not Uh, so much of effect on the ossicular chain uh, you can touch the fascian nerve but as long as the bony canal wall is intact it will not be damaged and then uh, you can remove it under vision so see this is a retraction pocket that i am unable to lift up with the with a gel form see it is all torn off see can you see that yes yes, yes. So here in this case we can use um, ktp laser to clear out the disease it, it is brilliant to stop bleeding uh it can be done through the posterior tympanotomy also and it removes the uh, disease um burns of the epithelium and you say that you know if you use a laser on the epithelium it completely burns off so it reduces the chance of recurrence but i'm not saying it it completely eliminates the chance of recurrence dr monal how often have you used this laser for the epithelium do you use it very often ah uh, very often if very i often. Fact, in fact whenever i have somebody with the cholestatoma i use it in the theater where i have the ktp laser Okay. I have, we have two lasers. We have the um, CO2 that I use for the uh, for the uh, stapes. Yes. But the, when I do the um, surgical procedure for a um, for a cholestatoma, my preference is to use, especially when I do intercranial retinal plasty. Uh, I tend to do it on the theater where I have the KTP laser. KTP laser. So there is a question from Dr. T S Chaudhary. He has been uh, quite uh, active in asking questions. Is that in severe otitis media after mm -hmm. clearing the aditus? Mm -hmm. Where the cartilage or temporal fascia would work better? I mean, what you showed points that cartilage is something which you would prefer. You know, in no, no, I always use cartilage and temporal fascia. Both. Both cartilage and perichondrium or cartilage and temporal fascia. The cartilage is never left bare uh, in the cases that I operate. But okay. I'm I'm sure that there are people who are using only cartilage. I I fully agree with that. But this has been my uh, way of doing things. I, I you can never be dogmatic in surgery. now right. the question comes to um, after you have done all this I, i how sure are you now because when when i showed you the first case where i lifted up the attic with the gel form and the retraction pocket over the attic where we done a complete scotum removal remove the disease you are reasonably sure but when you come to the last cases that i did whether you are done a ktp and all that but if you are not very sure you can definitely you can you must use an endoscope so here again we have a limited cholestatoma 18 year old girl deep retraction pocket lying on the foot plate the attic and antrum is normal again we are talking about early disease after canal plasty we are lifting it up we are drilling the posterior superior canal wall and uh, we have done a careful dissection lateral to the cholestatoma we are removing it under vision somebody asked me whether um, why do you want to open the antrum because here in cases like this if i did the uh, imaging for everybody i would not be operating opening antrum in this case but if i did not do imaging one of the best things to do is to open the antrum and making sure that there is no disease here so we have done a uh, ossicular reconstruction and here is what you see and let me just freeze it here so we using an endoscope so you can see this is the um, see that is the ossicular ossicle that is lying on the foot plate between the incus and the uh, foot plate that's a facial nerve that is attic that's a promontory mm -hmm. a round window area sinus tympani all these things can be seen using the endoscope so mm -hmm. uh, you have to do a use an endoscope to examine these areas to make sure that you're not leaving any gross epithelium behind but again the question is gross epithelium you will not be able to make out if there is little bit of epithelium So I think that's a very important take-home message which are giving for a lot of people. Who's there is one lobby which says we don't need an endoscope. Second person says we love an endoscope. So endoscope can always be used as an adjuvant in these kind of surgeries to know exactly where you stand. You know the extent of the disease. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, now, yeah. there's, there's just one question there one from Dr. Koshal, who hmm. wanted to know when do you do a cortical mastoidectomy and when do you do only a tympanoplasty? So, is it important for you to open the antrum in all cases? See, if you find that um, there is no disease in the mastoid antrum at all. On the CT scan or before? No. I mean, on the CT scan, you need not open the mastoid. But see, like I told you, I don't do imaging on all my patients for that fear of radiation. Okay. But if I am in doubt, I mean, I would, I mean, this is something that I've been wanting to do for such a long time. If I buy a cone beam CT, in fact, last time I was talking to Satish, uh, Satish was telling me about a cone beam that he bought and um, we were sharing some details. If I have a cone beam CT, which is accurate enough, the problem is that many of the cone beams that are selling in this country are meant for dental applications. They Correct. don't give uh, CT resolution that kind, kind type we want. And if you have a good cone beam CT, uh, and if I find the antrum is normal, I am not going to operate the antrum. But see, see time is of essence. You're operating five, six cases of terminoplasty a day. Um, what is the easiest method to know that there is no disease in the antrum? Op open the antrum. I mean, you can always do a posterior terminotomy. You can make sure the attic is normal. You can make sure the ossicular chain is normal. There are many things that you get from opening the antrum. And if anybody tells you that opening the antrum is going to cause more disease to the patient, definitely wrong. But, however, you must understand one thing. Of all the complications that are happening in middle ear surgery, mm -hmm. most of the complications happen because of mastodectomy. I mean, this, this, is, this is something you should not forget. So, if, yeah. if you're operating yeah. on that, yeah. if you're doing a mastodectomy for a cholesterol you must either be a good surgeon, many years of experience, sure of your technique, thereby you avoid using a CT scan and open the mastoid instead. Or you must be somebody um, who's always doing a CT scan and avoiding mastoidectomy as much as possible because you don't want to be creating any trouble for the patient. Correct, correct, correct. See, there's no point in being a heroic surgeon and producing a complication. I mean, this, this is absolutely certain. So when you're ta talking about uh, whether you want to open the master or not, why do you, I mean, what will happen if you open the master? People have done more than three and a half lakh cochlear implants worldwide and the vast majority of them have been done to the master. Correct, correct. Even those people who say that the, you know, there's a very a technique also open the master. But nothing has happened to these children many, many years later. Yeah. I've been doing an implant for 21 years. What has happened? Has they ever presented back to me the autodesk media? No. So mastoidectomy is not a problem. The problem is when you do a mastoidectomy, you produce a complication. You can produce a mastoid canal fistula. You can produce a semicircular canal damage. You can produce facial palsy. So that should not happen. So the, the argument against operating on mastoid is not because mastoidectomy is a bad procedure. It's because mastoidectomy is an inherent risk of do, producing a complication. Uh, one day when I was in a conference, I had given a talk and then somebody in the evening came to me and said that, Doc, sir, I did this mastoidectomy. But there was a facial palsy. I said, um, when, how long have I been operating? One year, sir. I said, um, um, but what did you do? I said, no, this is my first mastoid. I said, was there anybody with you? No. I mean, that's not how you go about it, isn't it? So you have to make sure that, see, there is something called a hierarchical system. Where somebody has to be, know, I mean, you should know what you can do, what you cannot do, very clearly. And Correct. then gradually what you can do should become more than what you cannot do. It will never become completely something that you can do. Okay, There are many things that I can't do. Many things Minish can't do. Many things that anybody can't do. Okay. But um, we make sure that we are operating on those things that we are able to operate well. In that context, operating a mastoidectomy should never be done if there is a chance for a complication. I hope I have made myself very clear. Yes. Now, uh, how do you prepare these patients? So this is what we do. So one is to assess the disease endoscopically. See, always when you're seeing these people preoperatively, see, your preoperative assessment is what makes the difference. You will decide at that point of time, do I want to mate this patient? Do I leave it alone? Do I follow up or do I operate? And that examination must be done endoscopically. You can't use an otoscope. In fact, you can't even use a microscope. Because okay. the endoscope is what shows, gets you the pictures, the pre-op pictures that I have are all endoscopic pictures. You need an audiogram. See, for example, somebody with a retraction pocket, normal hearing, no, no discharge, you leave alone. Because the audiogram is something that makes you decide on doing surgery. Right. You have to make sure that you have to retain always. The, whatever hearing the patient has got should never be lost following the procedure. I mean, that's the idea. Sometimes it doesn't work that well. You improve if possible. I mean, if you can improve somebody's hearing from 40 dB to 30 dB, brilliant. But for patient with other ear normal, they are not going to feel it at all, isn't it? 
you might say that oh, i did a great surgery but the patient will say oh doc still feels the same you should not try to reduce and you should image if cone beam is available or in doubt and at any point of time you have to plan for intracanular procedure i mean this is something that i have to tell people in early squamous disease i am again talking about and telling this again and again because we can't extrapolate this to every cholestatic method you have but when you talk about early squamous disease your intent must be to preserve the canal wall because if you don't preserve the canal wall you're leaving the patient with the problems of a cavity they can't swim they can't probably join for in the arm supposes they will have issues so you have to plan for intracanal wall i mean this is something that you must not forget when you're dealing with early squamous disease on, on this point on this point there's a question asked is that do you have a role of uh, any mastoid cavity obliteration i don't see one but in this no, mastoid cavity obliteration means is for uh, extensive cholestatoma when you do a canal wall down procedure yeah. i do so, not know if you can see my dog <laughs> Okay, so there he is. So um, he has come to find out what I am doing in the evening instead of. He also uh, like, helps you in the in cases, I presume. What? He also helps you in ENT. <laughs> he helps me staying cool. With 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 the knowledge you have, I think he might be also not a bad person to talk. <laughs> he he helps me retain my sanity sometimes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now so one more question from Dr. Ganesh Lahane. Uh, he asked that the cartilage used for osseous reconstruction. Do you feel that it gets absorbed over the period of time? And uh, another question from Dr. Kalyan is that: Do you have any comparative study of an autograft with Teflon or titanium or corp, uh, which you feel is better when it comes to the hearing part? Ah, uh, that's uh, the two parts of the two questions. One is that uh, the cartilage. I have felt uh, in many other cases that I followed up that the hearing is not as good. when the stapes is not intact i mean when you, when you have intact stapes when you put a graft a cartilage graft on the stapes and then cover it off with a graft the hearing is actually good but when the stapes is not intact a cartilage graft on the foot plate does not tend to retain good hearing over time i mean it works for 3 4 years but after that there is definite deterioration it may be because it either tilts or absorbs i don't know but there is definitely deterioration now the second question is that uh, teflon i have completely given up 90% of all the teflon that i put in fossic plus take stood i i don't do it at all if i do a, a titanium uh, osseous plasty delayed second stage titanium osseous plasty 70% of cases i get good hearing improvement with an absent stapes 70% i never do it for intact stapes I do a titanium osseous plasty only when there is an uh, absent stapes. Stapes. But again, thirty um, percent of them don't improve. Don't ask me why. But if I, if my procedure, uh, the my um, procedure choice is to use a uh, autograft ossicle when there is an uh, intact and mobile stapes and a normal uh, malleus. There, I think ninety uh, percent of all the cases there is good hearing improvement. So okay, that's what. So, so again, on this point. uh one point is that you did mention that you would not use a titanium when you see an active disease no 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 i won't surely yes and one question asked from dr kalyan was so in which cases would you plan to have a second stage surgery or stage of osseous plasty uh every patient who who have done intracanal vertebral plasty will go either for a second look non epi dw imaging mri or a second look or I mean either imaging non epi dw or a second look tumor plasty now okay. if the patient has got a significant hearing loss post operatively imagine that you are operating somebody with no stapes he's got a 45 db 50 db pre op hearing loss if i do osseous plasty if i do a cartilage tumor plasty without an osseous plasty patient will still have 45 db 50 db hearing loss and those cases i don't go for mri because i have to definitely operate on him surely isn't it Correct. so i will do a second look but if a patient has got good hearing post operatively i would actually do a non epa dw because i don't want to be messing up with whatever i have done so my choice between whether i will do a non epa dw imaging or whether i do a second look osseous plasty would be depending upon what is the post operative care correct, correct. Uh, so imagine that you do you do a non epi okay and you find that there is no disease if there is hearing loss you still have to operate correct. if there is disease you still have to operate then why do an mri Correct, so correct. the non epa dw imaging is done only when when there is good hearing the graft looks all right mm -hmm. so you feel that you can somehow avoid surgery so you do non non epi and then you mm -hmm. find that there is no disease you can avoid. so i'll go to the second flow chart 
So yes. my idea of doing OSIP plus T1 is to retain annulus, I told you. So that is why I don't like curating the posterior superior canal wall. The reason for me to do a small posterior tympanotomy in a um, small retraction pocket of the posterior superior cotton is because I would like to retain the annulus and the posterior canal skin and the continuity of the TM remnant. Okay. I do OSIC plus T only if I'm sure of disease clearance. Only if I'm sure of disease clearance. If possible, I use autograft ossicle or cartilage. Sometimes I use ventilation tubes, not always. That is something that I use. TM, if there is a large uh, retraction, it always must be supported with a large cartilage. And uh, what I mentioned earlier, second look uh, or non-EPIDW imaging, depending upon what is the status of the disease or the post-operative status of the patient. Yes, yeah, so on, on this point, there is a question by Dr. Bini Desai mm -hmm. from Bombay. She works with me and she's a good uh, Yeti guy lady. She asked this, in what conditions would you look at a second look ossicloplasty? I mean, in fact, when there is no incus or you have an exposed foot plate or in which specific conditions you would stage the, the ossicular reconstruction? Okay, now listen to this. Now, if I have, if somebody has got a really good hearing on one side, Correct. imagine that right ear has got good hearing, left ear has got a cholesteatoma and um, there is a 50 dB hearing loss. Okay, Correct. now, and no stapes. Now, if I do surgery on him, whatever I do in the primary procedure is going, never going to bring the hearing back to normal. Patient is not going to appreciate it. So I will always stage it. So I will let it be. Post-operatively, I see the patient after two years, one year, two years, and then ask the patient, are you happy with your hearing now? Yes. You say that, yes, doc, I'm okay. I mean, some problem right here, unable to manage. I don't do a uh, second look. I just do a non-EPI just to make sure that I'm fewer of disease. But if he's not happy with the hearing, I will do a second look procedure. Now, if you the patient has got patient an option for hearing aids in these cases, in case they don't want to do a surgery. That is exactly why I say that um, you should do intercanal vertebrinoplasty. Because when you do intercanal vertebrinoplasty, there is always an option of using a hearing. So a friend of mine, Professor Irvin Officius from uh, from uh, from uh, Antwerp, he always says that Manoj, for whatever you do, you should never avoid the opportunity of the patient using a hearing aid. It's like in snoring surgery. They said, whatever you do, the patient should always be able to use the CPAP later. Correct. I mean, you can't mess with the palate so badly that they can't use the CPAP. So similarly, whatever Correct. you do with the hearing, um, with the ear, they should never be in a condition where they can't use a hearing aid. You, know, you understand that is any audiologist worth their salt will know that it is very, very difficult to fit a hearing aid on a person with a large cavity. Correct, correct. Very tough. And uh, there's a lot of feedback. There's an echo. They're not happy. But if you have intercanal wall, the hearing, um, the fitting hearing it is absolutely easy. Now, um, like I said earlier about this thing I'd gone through earlier, how imaging does help. But there are uh, pro certain pros and cons of imaging. See, the pros are, it can help decide between whether you want to do intercanal wall, whether you want to do atticotomy, whether you want to do canal wall down. See, for example, if somebody has got a pure scutum disease, you can do just an atticotomy. Somebody has got a limited uh, posterior superior cordon disease in the, in the facial races. What I did for my first case would be brilliant. But if there's a lot of disease in the, in the antrum, you should do a canal wall down. You can assess complications like a fistula or a facial nerve uh, damage, which you probably would not have seen. See, for example, whenever I operate in somebody with the keratosis of the canal, extensive canal destruction. I always do an imaging because here the facial nerve would be exposed without facial palsy. Now, a third thing what I said earlier, it can predict hearing by ossicular chain status. Somebody with a bad hearing right ear, bad hearing left ear, uh, equal 50 dB, 50 dB. Both sides, you have a retraction pocket. Which will you operate first? You'll operate on that ear which has got an intact stapes. Because you, know, you operate on the ear without intact stapes, you're going to end up with a poorer hearing. It's never going to forgive you for that. Correct. But there are certain lot of cons. The cons are written in red. Radiation dose is critical. People have actually said that head and neck radiation can predispose to higher levels of thyroid cancer as you grow up. And there is data on this. So you're, you're, when you do a good uh, CT scan, 600 plus images, it is equal to 600 x-rays to a patient. It is significant radiation. Unless you do a cone beam, of course. It will not show ossicular mobility. You can never know whether the stapes is fixed or the foot plate is fixed. There is something that's a very difficult thing to judge. Correct. And imaging is prone to interpretation. See, sometimes people send me images that are taken from some places. I'm sorry to say, but some images are done really pathetically bad. Mm. See, because, for example, when you look at, when you 
see you all, must tell your radiologist when you see a semicircular canal on one side you should also see the semicircular canal on the other side <laughs> when you see the ice cream cone on one side ice cream because if there is a tilt in the image you can get a completely wrong interpretation of the image so you should not do so that is why you should uh, never trust see recently i had a patient who had a, a scan done and the scan the, there was a big description of how bad the cholestatoma is but actually it was a keratosis now the surgeon was a young surgeon did an operation did not had no idea how to deal with keratosis because keratosis you know it's a very difficult proposition the whole of the canal wall floor is damaged it goes into hypertympanum so it, he really got frustrated and had to refer but that would not have happened had the radiologist written keratosis obturans he would have been doubly careful because there in keratosis the problem is not only the extension of the disease the problem is normal hearing correct Correct. They will have normal hearing and very bad disease. So these are things that are issues. That basically, camouflage is your approach towards the patient. You feel that exactly. the hearing is normal. It's yeah, nothing really bad. Now, on this, uh, point, on this point, there's one interesting question which is asked by Dr. Avilash is that uh, would your, you have just given the wonderful protocol. So would your protocol change if it's the only hearing ear? Yeah, yeah it certainly would change. It certainly would change. certainly would change in such a way because in only hearing ear the important most important thing is safety correct i mean it is absolutely imperative i would always image whatever be it i would always image i would never do damage i will stage it even if i leave disease behind mm -hmm. see suppose sometimes i will find that the disease around the foot plate i will remove everything as leave the disease there and go back second time and take it off with the laser i mean everything would change but and the important thing is that never attempt to do an osteoplasty on a um, only foot plate patient with a uh, only hearing ear only functioning ear uh, it is a very dangerous thing to do but mm -hmm. overall is the same protocol but generally so now here i am going to talk about um, uh, what can you sometimes see when you do a second look now here there is a patient with i have done this is my own surgery done many years back uh, so it looks on the look through the canal looks all right the graft is intact so what we have done now is that um, through the canal we are given some local oh this is one full surgery whatever i think yeah. i somehow failed to edit it so we have done an endoral approach and um, while removing uh, that's a cartilage we lifted away and you see the epithelial pearl can you see that yes 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 the epithelial pearl yes epithelial pearl so here the epithelial pearl the important thing is epithelial pearl comes away it is like um, uh, you know those pearls that you see inside shellfish mm. rest of the middle ear looks all right to me healthy yes. healthy yes. and the uh, epithelial yes. pearl generally it comes away and uh, it is easily dissected free and there are many you know in fact you should not forget that there could be many yes and uh, and once you take them out everything completely that's a drum the completely intact and then that's the epithelial pearl how it looks Yeah. So, one question: Are these pearls? A lot of literature on them. Are they usually benign, or can they also cause some amount of erosion in due course of time? If you operate early, uh, no erosion. But if you operate late, there certainly could be erosion. So, here I am using the endoscope again. Mm -hmm. So, here you can see that what we have done is that we have taken out the microscope. We are using an endoscope, and this is in real time. Okay, somehow by mistake, um, uh, put the whole unedited video inside. so but i am using the endoscope this is completely unedited after removal of epithelial pearl going inside you can see that is the stapedius tendon incurs yeah. the facial nerve the middle ear that is um, part of the attic you can see the uh, oval window region that's a uh, cauda tympani so here um, uh, by using the endoscope you are able to see not only the different spaces in the middle ear but they also able to make sure that there is no disease behind in, in this specific case dr manoj there is a question from dr redmini and dr bini desai from mumbai yes what was the reason you went to operate this patient for the second time was it the hearing loss or was it the epithelial no, no 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 see i told you i will always do a second look i will do a second look always now in this particular patient um, uh, see i give the patient option between if the hearing is good would you like to do a non epi How would you like me to do a second look? See, because mm -hmm. the problem is a second look is free. The non EPI is expensive. Oh, it's free. It's free. Yeah, yeah. We operate the second look for free. We don't charge anything. 
Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. See, for some people, that is a better option. See, why do you want to spend eight thousand five hundred rupees for an MRI when you can get something free? Mm-hmm. Second look is part of the surgical procedure. It is part of the original surgery. It is not a separate procedure. So, what I'm trying to say is, in your protocol, after the first surgery or during the counselling of the first surgery itself, you tell them that you might require right. a second surgery. Yeah, which yeah. Would be free of cost. Which would be free of cost. correct correct so, so okay. when you when you are telling these people that in the counseling session we are told them that we will be doing for you either intact canal wall or a canal wall down one number one if yeah. there is intact canal wall it means that you will have to do a non epa imaging or a second look surgery depending upon the doctor decision at that point of time these two things are communicated to them in writing and they we keep a copy of their um, consent form and they have a copy and this is second look surgery you do as a blanket rule for all cases or just specific cases all cases of intact canal wall if i am not doing an uh, uh, non epi dw imaging okay if i am doing a non epi dw imaging i can sometimes avoid a second look correct correct if i do a non epi dw imaging um, uh, if i do i am not doing it for whatever reason see sometimes patient doesn't want a non epi because it cost more money see the problem is see it is not really about the non epi you do a non epi charge them so much and you find something suspicious you still have to operate right correct 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 it's not that non epi i would give you be absolutely normal it's not going to be like that so there are some people who don't want surgery even if it is free and for them i tell them see there is an option of doing a non epi and that is completely all right we can avoid surgery right right so when you do a second look just one last question from dr baisali sarkar from kolkata she asked that you ask for a second look surgery after uh, what period of time as a protocol two years two years, two years. always yes. two years okay i think two years is the right time because be- before two years you won't find that epithelial yes. fold that you get before and you also after- have the middle ear to give time yeah. to middle ear to heal so look at look at this middle ear that's a middle ear after i've done the uh, non uh, this removal of the epithelial fold looks so healthy isn't it right right right, right. very yeah. good a lot of blood vessels everything normal so you can see everything here and it looks perfectly fine you can see the stepidus tend and all that so yes. this is why we need to be operating on patients for a second look procedure because otherwise you will never know what is there inside Correct, correct, correct. Now, what is the hearing that you expect to correct? See, when you have, when you operate when the patient is around thirty dB, you will give hearing improve. You, you will preserve useful hearing, and don't expect the hearing to improve when you do cholestatum. I mean, this is a general figure. So, when you are operating cholestatum, you will be realistic. A vast majority of your patients will retain their preoperative hearing. A very small proportion of proportion of your patients would improve. It's very, very, very true. Yes. Very, very small proportion of patients will deteriorate. I mean, that's something that you should not forget. Also, a small proportion do deteriorate. I mean, you can't uh, like the question that I asked earlier. Suppose there is a patient that you are operating, you think that there is uh, all right, but then you find suddenly find out that there is no stapes. The graft is the sac is lying on the foot plate. Then you take it off, and the other ear is not very good. So you want to do a stage procedure. What will happen? You have a patient pre-operative thirty, post-operative fifty. I mean that also happens, right? Yeah, it is not happening because of mistake, but it's happening because of circumstance. Correct, correct. So, see, imagine that if you have this patient, see, 15 dB in the left ear, 42 dB in the right ear. Whatever kind of magic you do on the right ear, you're not going to get it close to the hearing on the left ear. Yes, yes. Never. So these patients are operating. Leave them alone. I mean, don't do anything to them. Now, um, what is the? How do you do predictability? See, you must do speech audiogram. So when you do speech audiogram, you will know how much of improvement that you are likely to get. Somebody with a 55 dB hearing loss, 70 percent discrimination. Don't try any funny stunts on him. I mean, it's not worthwhile. Okay. Then, see another problem with audiogram is the masking ability. See, if you have somebody with a 45 dB SN loss on the other side, and a 60 dB conductive loss on the left, correct. Okay. You can never mask this patient. I mean, this is called Norton's dilemma. You can't mask them, correct, correct. because when you give trying to mask the 60 dB, you have to give more sound on that side, right? I mean, correct. that's already got a 40 dB. How much will you increase on that? So, however good the audiologist is, that is a good audiologist would say, masking is not reliable, or masking dilemma may make the hearing to be worse than what it seems. You know, you get the thing written on your um, car uh, rear view mirror objects on the thing are closer than it appears so the good audiologist would write that say that see this hearing can be poorer than you think mm-hmm. because there is some issue with masking or a, a bad audiologist would not mask then you you're in more trouble 
So the third thing what I said is that hearing does not change with cholecystoma surgery. Therefore, we should operate early. And fourth is what we have been telling time and again, that do not hesitate to stage ossicle plasty. We always say that there should be no hesitation to stage. If in trouble, always stage. And never do it as a primary procedure. So there is a flow chart for management. So this is a very simplified thing. So you have an initial presentation. You have a primary operation. There's a routine follow-up. So there is a symptomatic course or delay or um, the, uh, recurrence. Then you have to reoperate. But if there is asymptomatic course, you do a non-EPIDW imaging. And then if it is normal surveillance or if it, there is problem, operate. Yes. You get what I mean? So this is my, the technique that I follow. This is taken from a journal. Uh, but um, this is what we do. So if there is a problem... Here, you know, for the benefit of some juniors who are here, you are asking now, what exactly is the difference between an EPA DW MRI imaging and a normal MRI imaging? Okay. See, non see diffusion weighting is a diffusion. There is a picture called diffusion images. Okay. So when you have somebody with, uh, um, when you take a diffusion image, the, the whole image will look blurred. Correct. You won't see the bone. You won't see the brain structure. But when you add a non echoplanar uh, this, see, this is an MRI imaging protocol to it. What happens in the same diffusion weighting, you will get uh, epithelium that is bright. Correct, correct, correct. So when you get an epithelium that is bright and um, the rest of it all grayish in color, you know it is a cholestatum. But if you find the epithelium, that, that area that you suspect cholestatum doesn't have a white color, that means, see, you need both non echoplanar imaging plus diffusion weighting to find out that whitish color of epithelium. So when yes. you do an MRI, you might picture, see, I, the other day, I, I got a question from somebody. He said, doctor, sir, I am seeing this patient with the AOM and mastoiditis. I said, how do you know it is mastoiditis? He said that there was MRI report. See, MRI cannot report mastoiditis. CT scan cannot report mastoiditis. Mastoiditis is a clinical diagnosis, isn't it? Yes. Similarly, yes. cholesteatoma cannot be reported by anybody. No, no uh, CT scan can say cholesteatoma for sure. But non-EPI DW can show cholesteatoma. Now, to, so to sum it up, so early yes. cholesteatoma need not be early. So any early cholesteatoma is not early disease. You have to operate with prudence. Not everyone, uh, let me, I can't see the thing, your face is coming in between. Okay. You have to operate with prudence and not everyone needs surgery. See, because just because somebody's got a traction pocket, somebody's got a thing, you don't operate on them. And like I said earlier, um, ear surgery is not cosmetic surgery. This one I often credit to my friend Sunil Kumar, who's a professor of ENT at, uh, at uh, Calicut Medical College. He always tells me that uh, this thing, which is very, very important, ear surgery is not cosmetic surgery. You don't want it to look good. You want it to function good. Okay. On, audiogram defines surgical approach. So when you have an audiogram, you decide on what you want. It predicts benefit. You have to operate early if definite indication exists. Radiology will help you in many ways, but only if you know how to read them. And absolutely, absolutely required is long follow-up. So when there is early cholesterol, you have to be more prudent than you're operating with late cholesterol. Early cholesterol is not a joke. In fact, I think it requires more skill to operate on early cholesterol than on late cholesterol. And uh, um, uh, so that is what it is, uh, Minish. So. Yes. Thank you so much. So this is uh, what we have done. I hope uh, I have been able to answer many questions. Do yes, we have sir. more talks coming in? More questions? Yeah, one minute. I'm just going there. We have some more questions which were missed out from the previous chat. So I'll just go back to them. Uh, one is that uh, uh, in your, in, in, in some of your, from Dr. Bhavik Shah from Mumbai, I think, uh, have you seen in some of your post-op cases with recurrence of retraction in spite of doing a, a very good job, which you show and we are all sure you do. And also, have you in your experience seen that initially the hearing improves, but then it deteriorates in due course? Yeah, both these things, yes. See, my one of the reasons why I started, or Minish, you asked me a question, if I use a large piece of cutlery, will the hearing um, not improve so much? Yeah. I mean, I agree. But the, there were times when I used to do these things like, you know, lift up the whole epithelium, go inside, clear out all the mucosal folds and put in steroid inside the middle ear. In spite of all that, I used to be terribly disappointed when I go back later and the, and the um, uh, retraction recurs, which is why we started using cartilage. Correct. Now, the second question is that, um, what is the second question there? 
Uh, the second question was that the hearing initially improves. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This this happens. This happens. So the the important predictor of long term uh, improvement of uh, long term retention of hearing is a intact and mobile stay piece. Mm -hmm. If you have an in intact and mobile stay piece, there is a possibility that this hearing would be static over a very long period of time. But if you don't have an intact and mobile stay piece, sometimes see the cartilage, the cartilage or ossicle that you keep between the foot plate and the malleus or the foot plate or the cartilage covering the posterior superior quadrant has to be vertical. Okay. Even a five degree tilt will make him lose hearing. See, one of the reasons why you have to stage ossicoplasty in somebody with a, with a absent stapes superstructure and a mobile foot plate is that in a healing process, you can never predict the tilting that happens to the process. I mean, you can't, you can't judge it. So, but if the ear, ear, dry, ear is dry and the uh, middle ear is all right and mm -hmm. there is no further retraction can happen, then putting in a process, you, the, your chance of error is much smaller. Right. Now, so, we have a compliment from you apart from the question by Dr. Vijendra. Oh. mentioned that uh, it was a very good session and uh, it was an excellent interaction. So, he's given oh. you a compliment. Sir. No, oh, thank you so much, sir. You are, you are our, in fact, uh, see, there are a few things that I had to say here. Now, uh, for us, when we were growing up to be ear surgeons, our most important people that we used to look up to at those times was Professor Mahadevaya and Professor Vijendra. I mean, these people are artists. I mean, I know that uh, we, we can never be close to them in any way, but they are truly skilled people. But unfortunately, um, those kind of things are like uh, Michelangelo's and all uh, thing, no? because they are great people. They do a lot of things. But for a vast majority of us, we have to remain safe. And that is very important. So what I went through those things is that, see, I am by nature an extremely suspicious person of my own ability. <laughs> I, 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 so I tend to be very, very careful, very, very prudent sometimes, very, very careful, maybe extra careful, but it doesn't do any harm. Yeah. Because um, I think that's, that must be the attitude of every young surgeon. So we have a few more questions. Can you take them? Oh, yes, please. Yes. A uh, question from uh, Dr. Yavar Muhammad. Uh, mm -hmm. He says that is, is there is a significant DNS and a spur in these mild retraction cases. Mm -hmm. Would you think about operating them first uh, before the ear or the, or the cholesterol in case there is? No. no. You would go for the ear straight away? No, I don't think it really matters. Doesn't See, really matter. not, we, I don't think there has ever been a proof, scientifically proof, that nasal airflow is related to middle ear function. It, has, it yes. has never been thing. Um, I mean, in fact, I have such a bad uh, deviation, uh, minish, I cannot breathe through my light nostril at all. It is completely blocked. That's because you don't trust ENT colleagues, I think. <laughs> but, uh, but nothing has happened to my ear. So you, you can't actually uh, <laughs> correlate between nasal septal deviation and middle ear uh, pressure changes. That, that doesn't happen. There's one question from Dr. Pooja uh, Suyan, who said that, is there any specific preparation of cartilage you do before you put it inside? Do you like a cartilage slicer or something like this? No, no, no. no. I, I, in fact, um, uh, I have bought so many cartilage slicers that I have 